love to have more people flood our buildings and truly be converted and the church grow in number. We would love to see that as well. We would love to see growth in the church. But how does the church grow? Is it by the ingenuity of the pastor? Is it by the ingenuity of the members or of the church? Is there some new method the church must use to reach the masses and make Christians stronger? You know, I have listened to some among the church in times past, and even so presently, who have pondered and fretted. What's something new we can do to get people into the church? What's something new that we can do to make the church grow? That's really the wrong question. We don't need a new thing. We just need the old thing. The gospel of Christ. Now we see that when the church seeks to take building itself into its own hands, it plunges itself into dangerous practices and philosophies of which we see many today. And I want to list just a few very briefly. These could be expounded further, but just briefly you will, you will see how these tie into many churches today. One of the first ones we see is secularism. What is secularism? Secularism is a philosophy that does not see beyond the world, but operates as if this age is really all that there is. As if today we, we, tomorrow we die, so let's live and do as we please, right? What happens when a church allows that mindset into it? It places theology and the study of God and truth, it places it on the back burner in order to appeal to the present age of the world. <laughs> It become, makes the church into a religious business, a building of its own kingdom at the expense of perishing souls. Secularism, believe it or not, is infiltrating many churches today in a very deceptive way. We see humanism. Humanism is a way of looking at life and people and practices apart from God. As Christians, we're to view everything through the lens of God and His glory. But how is humanism infiltrating? How is it affecting the churches? Well, the answer is that mankind has been made the substance of the church's focus. When the church's focus is all about man and for man, we've totally lost our mission. You understand the church is for God. The church is about God. The church is for the glory of God. We see relativism. Relativism is the doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality, they exist in relation to culture and society or historical context, and they're not really absolute. In other words, there's no absolute truth. Everything is just relative, connected to history, society, or culture. Many Christians practice this today. Basically, they interpret truth on how they feel about it and what their experience has been about it rather than the absolute truth of what has been penned and given in the Word of the living God. We see materialism. Materialism is very similar to secularism, but it's a focus, it's a focus on, that makes basically the gospel a product as if it's something to be sold. Did you know the gospel is not something you sell? It is something you declare. We don't have to manipulate people into conversions and confessions. We simply declare the gospel. And that, friend, is what is fundamental to understanding the power in the church is that it's not in us to, to, to try to be good enough to win people. It's about being faithful with the message that does win people. We don't have to be materialistic. And one, finally, that we see is pragmatism. Pragmatism is an approach that elevates theories or beliefs in terms of the success of their practical application. It is determining truth by practical results. You see, the mindset of pragmatism is overwhelmingly adopted in many churches today. Well, how is it? Churches begin to try new things, often unbiblical things, as a means of growing the church and reaching People. And if their pragmatism draws in the people, and supposedly it might affect their life in, a positive, life in a positive way, then surely it works, and then it's okay. I don't know if many of you saw this, but Super Bowl Sunday was a big one for pragmatism. Super Bowl services. Super Bowl services. Now, by all means, I'm not against the Super Bowl. I watched the Super Bowl. Go Chiefs, right? Let me give you a little insight. That was the only football game I've watched all year long. <laughs> and so I really wasn't rooting for either team. 
But there was one particular church service in which uh, the, 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 the service was centered around pretending and acting out the Super Bowl. Even kicking a Bible that looked like a football. All for the entertainment and appeal of the people. This is all under the name of church today. And it's unhealthy if it's at church at all. So here's what I think we understand. It's not up to church to manufacture growth by our ingenuity. And one of the reasons that many think we need to rethink church and use new methods of ministry, firstly, is because they fail to understand that they have no power to win anybody. The church doesn't have the power to win people. Using carnal or worldly uh, attractions to try to win people does not actually change people. What actually changes people, church, is the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ, unchanged from its purity. They also fail to understand that what you win people with is what you've got to keep people with. If you win people with carnal and secular ways, you're going to have to keep those ways up in order to keep those people because they've not been changed in the first place. This is about applying the Scriptures rightly and how we win people. But ultimately it boils down to this. Many churches who adopt these false practices and philosophies fail to understand that God alone saves sinners by His sovereign grace and adds them to the church as He pleases. Now here's what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18. This is the promise. This is the great comfort for me and for you. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's something that sticks out to me about this text. Who is it that builds the church? Is it Peter? Is it the apostles? Is it the membership? Christ says, I he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what does that show us? That shows us that the progress of the church rests solely upon the power of Christ. He alone has the power to save and he will do so. You say, well, how do you know that? Because he just said he would. <laughs> do you believe the words of Christ? Then look no further than to His promise, church. He does this by the word that He's given and not by new techniques or fads of the ministry. That is what you see in the early church and their health. The Bible tells us of the early church in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46 and 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the scripture says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what do we conclude with this point? We conclude that the power in building the church does not come from any one of us. Building healthy churches doesn't come from the pastor, doesn't come from you. It comes from, firstly, the glory of God, the power of God. The psalmist said in Psalm 127, 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. See, there is no building of the church by the power of men. But understand this. I want to bring this into this next segue of a point. This leads us to another question. Since Christ is the sovereign power over His church, He's the one who does the building, does that in some way negate the responsibility of His people in the church? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. See, while Christ is the power of a healthy church, He has ordained to use His people as a means in this great word work, which leads us to this second and final point. Don't get excited because this one has its own measure of content. Number two, I want you to see the scriptural practice of a healthy church. The scriptural practice. We see the sovereign power. You cannot have a healthy church without the sovereign power of Christ. But there is the scriptural practice of a healthy church. I want to give you three brief points here regarding this, and then we'll be done. The first point is this, is that scripture must be the authority of the church. 
Scripture must be the authority of the church. Now understand that, that every church must be grounded and guided by something. What is that something? What is that something? As we saw moments ago, some are guided by cultural and secular philosophies and methodologies. But what must govern the Christ church? It must be the scriptures. A pillar of a true biblical church is the scriptures and holding the scriptures alone as the authority for faith and practice. Now understand this, that holding the scripture as the authority... The only authority for faith and practice, it is an application of how a church is healthy. Because a church, if a church does not have that conviction, they will not be healthy. They must apply that. So we think about the scriptures being the only authority. Why not the latest insights from prominent Christian authors or church analysts or the latest blog posts that we see on the church? Because only Scripture is the divinely inerrant Word of the living God. And it gives perfect instruction. Keep that word in mind. Perfect instruction for the church. There's no flaws in the instruction for the church found in the Scriptures. And I quote what Paul tells to Timothy. Obviously, this is foundational. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 through 17. He says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. When Paul says all Scripture here, he refers to all of the sacred writings. The Old Testament and also the New that were in the process of being written. Timothy's primary Scriptures he would have been using would have been the Old Testament. And as the early church got letters from Paul and New Testament Scriptures written, those would have been used as well. But you notice what Paul says of the Scriptures, that they are breathed out by God. Now you consider that truth for a moment. Who is God? He is the eternal, only God. He's the perfect God in all of His essence. In other words, error is an impossibility to come from God. Would we expect an imperfect word to come from a perfect God? Not in the slightest. John Calvin rightly said, We owe to Scripture the same reverence which we owe to God, because it is proceeded from Him alone, and it has nothing of man mixed with it. So you think of the imperative nature of the Word of God being the authority. And since the Scriptures are the authoritative voice of God, what do they do? Here's what they do. They accomplish God's purposes in His people and in His church and in the world. We don't need to look to other things outside of the Word of God, do we? The Scriptures are the means of a healthy church. God said through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55 and verse 10 through 11, this is a great one to note. He says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to be empty. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. That gave me great comfort as a young preacher who thought everything depended on him. Am I the only one like that? You're a young preacher, you're young in the ministry, and you think that, man, you've got to do everything and success depends on you. It doesn't. It doesn't. You, you be faithful to the Word of God, and God will accomplish His purposes through it. Now, Paul just told Timothy that the Scriptures are profitable, that, that these are the things that develop God's servant. They develop the church. And, and so what's this mean for the church? The Scriptures are the means of cultivating a healthy church. Why? What is a church made of? A church is made of, a healthy church is made of, of healthy, genuine converts. Men and women who have been born again, made alive in Christ by the gospel. Now, if you read that passage in Timothy in verse 15, right before he gets into verse 16, Paul just said and reminded Timothy of the sacred writings, the scriptures that brought him to salvation. You understand that conversion is the first need of the people. Salvation. Well, how will that come to them? 
through the Word of God being preached to them, through the Gospel being proclaimed to them. The Scriptures is the means of conversion, but it is also the means of establishing a church in a healthy way, in sound doctrine. You know, Paul told Titus in Titus 2.1, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Well, in a, in a physical sense, it means to be in good physical health. That's what the definition gives us. In a spiritual sense, it means to be sound or free from error. So you, you understand that sound doctrine is spiritually healthy doctrine that is not in error. It is the truth that God has given to the church. And so the church is called to uphold and teach sound doctrine, healthy doctrine as given from the Lord. And you will see that's the foundation of a healthy church. This is the reason, church, that sola scriptura, that scripture alone is a pillar to every church in its function. Because a church not founded and grounded on the word of the living God is unhealthy and is subject to many false ministry philosophies and practices that are infiltrating the church today. The Word of God, church, always does the work of God. You don't have to look to anything special outside of that. The Word of God is supernatural, and that's enough. But notice with me, secondly, regarding this point. Brings, this is diving in more into application. But about, by all means, having the Scriptures as the authority is application itself. It must be the conviction and heart of the people. But notice the letter B is that Scripture also must be the appetite of the church. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Nearly every church will claim the Word of God as their authority in God. Oh, they love the Bible. Yes, we love the Bible. That's, that's, that's what we're supposed to live by, right? And yet many churches still remain unhealthy who claim such. Why is that? It's a noble thing to claim the Scriptures as your authority. But it's a healthy thing to actually have an appetite for the Scriptures regularly. There's a difference. There's a difference between just claiming the Bible vaguely as what it is. Anybody in the world can say that, even among the church. But it's an entirely different thing to actually feed upon the Scriptures and want to be fed the Scriptures. And this truly is where the rubber meets the road of a healthy church. If a church gathers together all under the name of the Word of God, but they do not actually feed upon it, it's not nourishing their souls, they are unhealthy. An unhealthy church does not feed upon the Word of God. It's almost like someone claiming, you know, I buy lots of apples, and I take apples home because apples are good for my body. But the person never eats the apples. It's not good enough to know that apples are good to eat or whatever other fruit or vegetable you like. If you don't eat that which is actually good for your health, it's not going to affect your health. And so that brings us to our original text. What's Paul say to the church here in Ephesus? If you're still there, I don't think I've had you turn anywhere. I don't remember. I mainly just quoted. We will turn somewhere else here in a moment. But this brings us back to the application given from this passage of Scripture. What is it that we read here? What does Paul say was given to the church for her maturity and spiritual growth? You could also say spiritual health. In verse 11, we read that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. What is the role of these offices? It's to care for the flock of God by firstly feeding them the Word of God. Remember what the apostles said in the early church concerning the priority of their ministry when widows were being neglected and there was other ministry that was needed in the church. They ordained, or they ordained seven men to help serve in those areas. But they gave a reason for that. Not that they were above serving in those areas, but they gave a reason why others needed to help in the service of the church. Acts 6.4, the apostles say, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to what? The ministry of the Word. All through the Scriptures you see the centrality of the Word of God being ministered to the people of God. Now today's church office in the ministry is that of the pastor and teacher, those who feed the people of God. But notice the purpose and impact of their ministry. Look at verse 12. 
What does it do? The Bible says, God says, it is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. You notice the pastors and teachers here, they're, they're, they're not ministering the Word to equip themselves, although that applies. Paul says it's to equip the saints. Because the church's mission is a not a pastor's mission or a missionary's mission, it's a church mission. The church collectively is called to be growing, is called to be maturing, is called to be obeying the Word of God. And that all comes firstly through the ministry of the Word. You see, this is a healthy church. This, healthy church, this is healthy church growth in the church accomplished by the ministry of the pastors and teachers laboring in the Scriptures. You come on down through this passage and you read verse 13 and 14. Paul further expounds on this maturity that the people of God are to be brought to. And part of that maturity is this, that they may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Well, why in the world would he refer to Christians as children? Because Scripture plainly reveals to us that when you become a believer, you don't start out as a spiritual adult, although you may be older in your years. When you become a believer, you're a spiritual babe in Christ. And Peter says to his audience, desire the milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. You grow up in, in Christ. And that's the point here is that, is that a healthy church is growing and continuing to grow. It, when a church comes to a point where they think they're done growing spiritually and they think they've arrived, they're plunging towards an unhealthy state. Christian, understand this. You never stop growing in your Christian life until the day that you die. You just don't. And if you ever come to the point where you think that you're done growing, you've been deceived. You've, you've been misled. You've, you've convinced yourself of something that is unhealthy for you in your Christian life and in the local church. So Paul is describing here a church that is growing in a healthy manner and is rooted in the ministry of the Word of God to them. Now you recall what Paul tells Timothy in the same context of proclaiming the divine inspiration and its effectual working. After he said that all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable, in chapter 4 verse 1 through 2 he says this, I charge you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living, and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, he charges Timothy, these three words, this charge, he says, preach the word. I love that. Not just because I'm a preacher, because that's just what the church needs. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience, complete patience and, and teaching. Why does Paul want Timothy to preach the Word to the people faithfully? One, it's inspiration. Two, it's effectual working. But also because of what would come in assault to the Word of God. He continues in that passage, if you look at verse 3 and 4, and he says, "...for the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, sound teaching." But have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth to wander after myths. Let me ask you, church, do we see any of that today? Absolutely we do. It was active in Paul's day. It's been active through church history. It's active today. And that's the reason the Word of God being central is so crucial to the local church. Charles Spurgeon rightly said the time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. We see a lot of that. We see it more because of social media and technology, right? Everything's out there, right? But this is what we find is the assault upon a healthy church. The church's health will be directly contingent upon the Word of God being faithfully preached and readily received. The Word of God must be expounded to the people. It must be brought to the people. And I know this leans heavy upon the, the pastor's role. But you understand the church is also accountable for that because they're accountable for who they put in the pastorate. What kind of man they put in the pastorate. 
Is this a pastor who just gets up there and him hauls around with stories and jokes? Or does he preach the Word of God? And so this is crucial on both sides to a healthy church. You think about expounding Scripture, what that means. To exposit Scripture is to dig into the text and set forth what the text means from its original context. Because our goal in studying the Scriptures is always to discover the truth, not determine what the truth is. God's already determined what the truth is. Our reading and study of Scripture is discovering what truth He has revealed. We don't determine its meaning. We discover its meaning as God gave it. And so you understand that when the Scriptures are expounded clearly for the people to understand the truth God has given them, they're being fed this way. They're being given the healthy spiritual sustenance that saves and grows their souls. A healthy church must be taught this and experience this as a healthy pastor practices this. Do we see any examples of this? I want to give you one good example, I think. And I'll turn to your Bible in the backwards the Old Testament to the book of Nehemiah. I used this recently. We're actually going through a, a series on Wednesday nights where we're talking about certain characteristics of a healthy church and many characteristics that can apply to a healthy church and I think are marks of them. And one is the exposition of Scripture and just the Scripture being clearly given to the people and applied by the people. And that's what we're talking about today, the application of the Word of God, the importance of it for the church to be healthy. But Nehemiah chapter 8, and you understand that Nehemiah comes at a time when the, the Jews are returning back to their land from exile. Nehemiah was burdened and broken about Jerusalem being destroyed and its gates burned with fire. And under God's providence, he leads a way backwards to rebuild the walls and the gates. And God is doing a wonderful work of restoration and renewal for them. But you understand that it's not just their location, it's not just their building, their, their temple, or, or their walls that need to be rebuilt. All of that is futile if they neglect this one thing, the Word of the living God. And here's what we find. Ezra and other leaders of the church, they begin to gather all the people. If you read verse 1 down and forward, they gather all the people to one face and, and they're, they're listening to the Word of God from morning till afternoon. Talk about a long-winded sermon. Consider y'all blessed that we don't preach half a day. Because I, I probably could. All us preachers probably could, right? All right. But look at verse 8. This is just one example of what it means to exposit something. They read from the book of the law clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. They didn't just get up there and read it and say, there you go, go with it. They actually expounded and explained what the text said and meant. And as you come on down through this text, let me read verse 9 down through verse number 12. Look at how it affects them. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and spit, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to the Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites claimed, calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and send portions to make great rejoicing, because they because they had understood the words that were declared to them. What do you see in this text? The Scriptures are clearly expounded to the people. And those scriptures clearly expounded have cut to the heart of the people. And that is God's design for the church in the New Testament. That's His design for His Word for His people in all ages. That His Word clearly applied, expounded and applied, hits the heart of His people. It doesn't just go in one out, in air out the other. It's not just put out there as if some, some deep theological truth. It's, it's about expounding it clearly for the people to understand, to, the, to, to make a difference in their life. That's what Ezra and the leaders of these people are doing. These people, as you read this passage, were cut to their heart. 
And I want you to understand that this is what the church has always sought to do. It is to expound Scripture to the hearers. Expound Scripture to the hearers. Today we have many advantages that the early church didn't have. We have a completed Bible. We have more Bibles available to us than we don't even know what to do with. The church, early church didn't have that, but yet they still expounded Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, as it was written. We see it in Peter's sermon, Stephen's sermon, as they're, they're bringing text to bear in their right context of what they mean and how they apply, especially in reference to the Messiah who they're trying to show everybody Jesus is the Christ. He's the one. It's written in the Scriptures. The Scriptures were the foundation and the means of saving and cultivating the people of God. And I will say this, that a healthy diet of the Scriptures expounded to God's people cultivates a healthy body in the local church. Because when the Scriptures are lacking as the sole authority and as the appetite of the church, it is in an unhealthy state and in a dangerous state, as it was for Israel when they neglected the law of God. What happened because of the neglect of the law of God? It brought about their own destruction. God said through the prophet Hosea, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They were not being given faithfully the word of God as they meant, as they needed it. That brings us to this last and final point. I think this ties everything to one, one final focus here. Is this all that's needed for the church? Is this all that's needed for the church? Do they just need the authority? Do they just need to have an appetite? There's one more thing wrapping this up. And that is that the Scripture must be applied by the church. The Scripture must be applied by the church. You understand, it, it is not enough just to hold the Scriptures as your authority. It's not enough even just to feed, the script, feed on the Scriptures. The Scriptures have to be obeyed. The Scriptures must be applied to the life of the Christian and to the church overall. Scriptures must be applied, not just affirmed. And here, and I believe, is another great detriment to the church today. It is that it is neglecting the obeying of what God has called us to be and do in His Word. How much good does the church do? If she sits only within her four walls, rejoicing in the truth that she has, but never taking the truth out there. The church is meant to impact the world for the name of Christ. Jesus said, go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to the whole creation. He said, because He has all authority in heaven and earth, go into all the nations and make disciples, make disciples teaching them all things that He's commanded them. And we could dive into many areas where the church may be lacking in her obedience. We don't have time for such. But instead, let us see the principle from the text. Look with me in Nehemiah, if you're still there, in chapter 8. Look at verse 13. I found this interesting. Verse 13 and forward. The Bible says, On the second day, the heads of the Father's house of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in, all, in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive with wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts. And in the courts of the house of God, and the square at the water gate, and the square at the gate of Ephraim, and all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths for the days, for, for from the days of Jeshua the son of Nun to the day the people of Israel had not done so. And they were very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days. On the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. What do you, what do you find happening in this text? You find the people studying the scriptures, realizing there's something they've been not doing that God said to do. So what do they do? Do they go on their merry way and just continue not doing what God said to do? 
No. They immediately begin obeying and applying the Word of God to their life and to their nation. Is this not what the church is to do also? Do you remember what James said to his Christian hearers? James chapter 1 and verse number 22 and forward, he says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently on his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty perseveres, being no hearer, but not being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. You understand that to only hear the Scriptures and affirm the Scriptures without applying the Scriptures makes the Scriptures a mere religious relic for the church. And I'm afraid that is what's wrong in many churches today. They love the Word of God, but they don't obey the Word of God. That makes for an unhealthy congregation. And may I encourage us today that we need to be healthy congregations. We need to obey the Word of the living God. The church is called to obedience. And it is through obedience that she will be and do all that Scripture says. She is to love the Lord her God with all of her heart. Love her neighbor as herself. She is to proclaim the gospel in all the world, making disciples of every nation. She is to be the light of Christ, to follow godliness, to live in a holy manner, to declare the glory of God. And it is the duty, friend, of the whole church to apply the Scriptures. I'm afraid many only lean on the pasture to carry out the work of God. It is not that way. The church must carry out the work of God. The church is His army, marching forward, having the banner of truth, and must uphold it. The pastor cannot do it himself. The church must do it. You'll notice in Nehemiah, it wasn't just Ezra, the, Ezra or the, or the uh, leadership that was doing it. It was all of the people of Israel going and gathering what they needed to accomplish this feast. You know, Paul said to the Philippian church in Philippians 1.27, he says to the church itself, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ for so that whether I come and see you or if I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Church, when a church is unified in their oneness, oneness in their cause, oneness in their activity, oneness in their obedience to the Word of God, they are a healthy church. Because unity in oneness surely is a true mark of a healthy church. So understand that obedience to the Word of God is the way to health in the church. Many seek to get healthy by getting instructions from a doctor who knows all about health, right? You go get a diet plan, a workout plan, whatever. But that plan is not going to do anything for you if you don't actually do it and carry it out. You can gain that from experience. There was a time I had a particular health issue and needed resolved. And so I went to the doctor, had him examined and give me some direction. Got the right supplements and the right liquids I needed to be taken for this issue. And what did I do? I let him sit on the counter for a few weeks. <laughs> Anybody else with me on that? Amen. I heard an amen there. And then I finally decided I'm going to actually do what he laid out for me to do. And the funny thing happened. I got better after I actually did what he told me to do. Application is crucial to the good health of the local church. So much more could be said about building a healthy church, and I have not exhausted it all. But I want you to understand that, that a healthy church must have these foundational truths and recognize these two main points, that Christ, He's the sovereign power of a healthy church. Everything is done through His power and according to His providence. 
But that doesn't negate our own responsibility that the church must have the right scriptural practices to be a healthy church. The church must hold the scriptures as its authority. The church must have an appetite for the Word of God. The church must apply the Word of God. And when we do that, church, we will bring glory to God to the fullest like we are meant to. To Him be glory in the church through Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. May we be this church. Let us pray. Father, we bow before you this morning and thank you, God, for your word. We'd be lost without it. And sometimes maybe we just get, we get a little too accustomed to the word. It just becomes part of our routine rather than, rather than us having a deep love for it. Father, I pray that you would revive our hearts in this manner. Bring about restoration and renewal to your church in this day and age, like you did in the days of Nehemiah. Help us to see, Lord, how important it is to pursue and desire a healthy church, and that, Lord, you can and do develop healthy churches when churches love your word, when they hold it as their authority and they apply it to their life and live it out and obey it. Help us to be healthy today, healthy Christians, a healthy church. And I pray that you be glorified in all things said and done here today. In Jesus' name, amen.